Today we have our very own Aranjit to give us the message. Let's commit him to the Lord. Father God, we uphold Aaron before you. We thank you that you have raised him up to minister to your people. Anoint his lips, Father God, that whatever he says, whatever message he has for us will be of you. The message will be strong and powerful and effective because it comes from you. Let us, O oh Lord, have open hearts and open minds to receive what you wish us to hear today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. one two okay it's trying to see if this works or not thank you sister Mandy and thank you everybody for gathering here she gave me a big pressure maybe powerful so I don't know how powerful it's going to be I hope it touches you that's the most important thing la. and I hope that you are transformed by this because it took me it, it I was pondering on whether I was going to share this or not because last week we had such a great message by pastor Dave Redenberg about joy and I don't want to be a party pooper, but well, it is what it is. It's the Word of God, so I can't argue with it. But I do want to uh, greet you all in the wonderful name of the Lord, and it's very excited to always share a fresh new word, and it's very excited to be on here, not just to speak, but to proclaim the Word of the Lord as it ought it should be. Now, we're going to look into a story that is taken from the book of Mark, okay? And the last time that I was here, I shared a message based on the book of Mark itself that was um, inspired by Jesus calming the storm. And we're going to look in chapter 11 just to see where we head on here, okay? And we're going to split into three parts, okay? From verse 12 to 14, 15 to, 20, to 19, and 20 to 24. Now, why I split into three parts? Why, uh, hallelujah. Okay, why I split into three parts? Maybe they doesn't want me to share this message. Um, but I split into three parts because there is a connection here, regardless whether I split it or not. And we're going to have a look and see where this account takes us. From verse 12 to 14. Now the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. This is he meaning Jesus. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, Let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. Then part two here says, So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house should be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it into a den of thieves? And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people were astonished at his teaching. When evening had come, he went out of the city. Now we're going to part three. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to them, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered away. So Jesus answered and said to them, Have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be removed and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Now in Mark chapter 11, Jesus goes to pick fruit from a tree and finds nothing. So what does he do in here? He kills it. Seems to be a pretty weird account because the son of man who can calm the storms and the seas all of a sudden goes to an innocent looking tree, decides to kill it. It's kind of a funny account, isn't it? You don't go to a fruit tree and curse it, but 
this should greatly concern you. You see, for centuries, people have tried to figure out why Jesus kills this tree. Was there something wrong with the tree? Was he just really hungry? Or is there a much deeper meaning to this? You know, we're going to go through this to understand that this story is a much bigger part that Mark is trying to tell us in chapter 11 that impacts you and me in significant ways. Now, before we can understand why Jesus kills this tree and why this matters so much to us, we first have to understand why Jesus encounters this tree at the first place. You see, we begin chapter 11, Jesus is entering Jerusalem just a few days before his death. Okay, Christians known to this day is known as Palm Sunday. And it's a huge moment in Jesus' ministry, so much that what has been happening in the last 10 chapters of Mark's gospel has been leading up to this moment. You see, in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus announces that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand or some translation will say the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe in the gospel. And here we see that Jesus is riding in to Jerusalem like a king. But there's a few critical things about this moment that you shouldn't miss. For instance, Jesus rides and begins his journey into Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives, which is where it's a source of prophecy. In the book of Zechariah, Chapter 14, verse 1, 1, 4, and 9 mentions, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. And in that day, his feet will stand on Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day, it shall be. The Lord is one, and his name one. Some translation was saying his name is the only one. But for everyone witnessing this moment, they know this verse, okay? And why I say they know this verse? Because they're not just laying palm branches for some random person. They know this verse. They see the prophecy being fulfilled in front of their eyes. They know who Jesus is. And He's fulfilling it. And they realize that Jesus is intentionally entering as the promised King who has come to free the Israelite people. Now, He has come to usher in God's kingdom, God's reign upon the earth. And during this moment, Caesar is a Lord, Herod is a King. Jesus is all of those things. And just so that there's no doubt, Jesus rides in on a colt, a donkey. Something else that Zechariah mentions in chapter 9, verse 9, when he says, Behold, your King is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. But you see here, as I said, Jesus isn't just living out prophetic promises here. He's also doing something very modern, something that is very familiar to the crowd. He's riding in like a general, like an emperor. You see, in Roman society, whenever an emperor or a military official would enter into a town, he would return from a very victorious campaign or from an event that's quite much like how Jesus is entering us. There would be crowds, there would be fanfare, and he would ride, sometimes a, an emperor or a general would ride on a horse or an elephant, symbolizing his power and greatness. And there would, be, there would be such an atmosphere of praise. And they would all be thinking that this is the man who saved the people, and the people would recognize this as Jesus entered the city. But they would also know, notice that something is a bit different on Jesus' entrance. His transportation was smaller. His crowds were humbler. His entourage was simpler. Jesus didn't enter with sword and splendor. He wasn't surrounded with pol pol politicians and nobility and, and, and wealth. He was a different kind of king. A king for every person that would usher in a different type of salvation. And here is why it's so important to understand this, because why is it so critical to understand the situation with the fig tree? Everything about this scene in Mark 11 proclaims who Jesus is. The laying down of palm branches, the clothing, and the quoting of Psalms 118, which by the way is quoted in chapter 11 verse 9, says, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes to the name of the Lord. Everything that we have talked so far highlights one simple important fact, and you and I, we cannot deny this. The answer is Jesus is the Messiah. Amen? 
I don't hear an amen. That means I must have said something wrong here. <laughs> amen. Okay. I, as I said, this is a party pooper kind of sermon. So if you can't take it, it's okay. As long as I get God's message out there. But remember something here. He is the promised son of David. He's the king that people would have been waiting for and the crowd, they get this. As I said, they're not just laying down branches for a random person here. It is for somebody that the prophecy has been fulfilled. And they are ready for it. But there's one thing we've seen in Mark's gospel that makes Jesus matter almost anything else. Something that has made him furious. Last week we learned about joy. Now we're going to go to a whole new different level now. Forgive me, but it's the Lord's will for me to share this. That has made him furious with religious leaders and even his own disciples. Yes, even his own disciples. Is that any time someone tries to get in the way of that kingdom, who prevents people like the crowds in this scene from being able to follow Jesus. And that is exactly what we're about, what's going to happen next. You know, in quick succession, there are two events that occur here that we often treat it separately, but they're very much connected. Firstly, we're going to go through Mark 11 from the three parts that I've said earlier. The first one is, on the following day, after Jesus' triumphant entry or grand entrance, Jesus leaves the place where he's staying in a town called Bethany and begins walking back to Jerusalem. And as he's walking, he gets hungry. He sees a fig tree. He decides to satiate or to fill his hunger. But he gets to the fig tree. And there's no fruits on it. And what happens to us to be such a superfluous detail Mark adds that the fig tree not only has no fruit, but has nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Now, it seems a pretty simple way to understand. You're hungry, you want to pick food, fruit from a tree. Some of you probably have plant trees or fruit trees in your home. If it's not in season, you don't pluck it. You don't, you don't do anything to it. You probably fertilize it. You probably replant it. You probably start all over again. I don't know how you do it. I'm not a planter. I'm just going by what I see. But... Normally, you don't do anything by cursing it, right? You don't curse the tree saying, please give me some fruits. I'm so hungry, I'm, I want to eat. You don't curse it. But in this case, this is a whole new different kind of situation we are looking at. Pay attention because this will matter in a minute. So after Jesus sees the situation with this fig tree, it appears that he's so frustrated, he curses the tree declaring that it should never again bear fruit. And in a brief piece of sad commentary, Mark lets us know that the disciples heard Jesus say this. Because as I said, it will matter in a minute. Now after Jesus leaves this victory, Mark then shares with us the second important event that occurs here. On this morning, Jesus enters the temple and when he does... Jesus immediately starts driving out those who are buying and selling things in the temple courts. He overturns tables and chairs. He keeps people from carrying objects through the temple courts. He tells them that they've turned the temple into a den of thieves. And as we're reading this, all we can think about... Don't get offended here, okay? Don't throw stones at me after this. And as we're reading this, all we can think of, this doesn't sound like Jesus at all. Some of you are looking at me, you are cursing me with your eyes right now. But let me tell you something right now. If Jesus calms the storm powerfully, this is a whole new different side of Jesus that we have never seen before. Um, as I said, last week we learned about joy. You know, when Pastor Dave mentioned that Jesus was always happy with his disciples, well, I don't know about you, but here tells me that Jesus overturned the tables ferociously and angrily. And I mean, never before in Mark's gospel, Jesus has, has Jesus been so angry. Never has he once done anything like this. Was he just really mad about the fig tree? Was he really just hungry and he needed something to eat right now? Or is there something much bigger than what's occurring here that causes Jesus to be so angry and so mad and in, this is where we all really need to start paying attention here because this is where we begin to realize why this killing of the fig tree matters so much because all of this is connected in order to see this connection. 
basically we need to know something very important about temples and about figs. Okay? A lot of people, they treat it separately because temples are building, fig is a fruit or a plant. And we often treat it separately, but they're very much connected here. Now let's go to see and understand why it's so important. Sorry, I skip a bit of this. Aha, uh -huh. no. Okay, here we go. And we'll start by learning something that's very important here about the Jerusalem temple. The, now, what I'm showing you right now is a simplified version of the Jerusalem temple that's during the time of Jesus, okay? Um, and if you look closely, you can see you can see that it's designed as a series of spaces that take you closer and closer to God. The most intimate and holy space in this entire building is called the Holy of Holies. And this is where the presence of God rested. Around that and outside of that, you have is the priest courts, the court of Israel, and various other courts that the Jewish people could go. But outside of all that, outside of all of the spaces, you had the court of the Gentiles. And if you weren't Jewish, this was the only place you could go. So technically, they can still worship God in the temple. It's just in that area. You see, during religious festivals... Oh, sorry. Let me, let, me, let me just quote here first a little bit. Judging by the size of this picture, you would think that it's a very large space. And it is. It is a large space. But when religious festivals came around, it was packed. I'm talking about try cramping 10 or 20 people into a five people elevator and see how cramped it is. It's so cramped that so many people here would come to do the marketplace. And this is exactly how big the marketplace was. And you see, during this time of religious festivities, this outer section of the court of Gentiles, this was where all the vendors set up their tables, where their livestock were being sold and other things that could be used for sacrifices. It was where money changers usually would sit to exchange other currencies for this temple currency. And just to give you an idea on how packed it was, a res I did research earlier on a historian that's named Josephus. He's a Jewish researcher. He says that in one Passover week, 255,000 lambs were bought, sold, and slaughtered in this area. A quarter of a million. And you can understand why it's so packed, why this place, and why Jesus turns the tables here. This is actually what Jesus sees when he enters the, temples, the temple with his disciples. When they enter the temple ground, and this is where Jesus overturns everything. This is where he goes furious. He goes berserk and destroys everything that is here. Now the first question often we ask is why? Why Jesus overturned the tables? And our natural inclination is to say that why did he flip all the tables? Well, the answer is already there. But the question we should probably ask ourselves is, why did he turn the tables over here? Why did he turn the tables over here in the court of the Gentiles? Now, Jesus being a Jew, he could have straight gone to the high priests and the scribes that are in the Jewish area and just told them and scold them off. But instead, he creates a scene that grabs people's attention. Have you ever gone to a crowd where it's so crowded you don't pay attention? When all of a sudden something happens, then your all eyes turn to that corner. And if you see this part here, in verse 18, after the part where the scribes feared him and everything, because the people were astonished at his teaching, they all were paying attention to what was happening after Jesus flipped the tables. Normally when you go into a crowd, nothing happens. You're just busy, people walk past you, you don't even know who the person is next to you. But when a scene is created, everybody's eyes turn to the scene and they start paying attention to what's happening. And here is where Jesus gives a big scene. But before that, we also have to ask another question. Okay, we also have to ask this because if he, why did Jesus turn the tables here? And it's the answer to that question that helps us to understand everything else that's going on. You see, as I said, like this space, this court of the Gentiles, this was the only one only place where Gentiles could go and worship God. This was the closest that they could get to the presence of God. This is the only place that they can worship. But not only they are clear, clearly not part of this community of faith, 
just based on the restrictions surrounding where they can go in a temple, but even in the place where they are allowed, they are kept from worshipping. This place of worship, and Jesus said, has been turned into a den of thieves, to a market of chaos. And Jesus is furious. You see, one of the things that we have seen throughout Mark's gospel, and if you read the other gospels as well, that Jesus is constantly reaching out to Gentiles and opening doors for them to be part of God's kingdom. Examples that I can give you based on what I researched from Mark's gospel and all that, it's, hold on, okay, is the demon-possessed man, the Seraphonician woman, the countless people he has reached in Judea, Tyre, Sidon, and Perea, so on. There are so many events that Jesus reached out to Gentiles. These have all been Gentiles, and Jesus has offered them salvation. In many cases, Jesus even traveled to them to reach out to them. Jesus didn't believe that God's kingdom was only open to the people of Israel. His kingdom is much bigger than that. So when he sees what's going on in the temple, he overtly and obnoxiously, how overtly and obnoxiously Gentiles are being excluded, Jesus flips out. In other words, he gets mad. Literally, he starts destroying the things that are keeping the Gentiles from worshipping. And then something really interesting happens then. Jesus returns to the fig tree. Now remember what has happened in the first time when Jesus passed this tree. It says he was, he was hungry, there was no fruit but leaves. And these are very tiny details. They seem like it doesn't matter to us. But to the people listening back then, the people who lived around fig trees, grew fig trees, relied on fig trees, when, which is why that when Jesus curses this fig tree, there's a bigger meaning to it. When they leave the temple and when they go back, the tree is finally dead. But to understand more of this, you have to understand the figs. What are figs? You see, in Middle Eastern you know, countries, fig trees, <clears throat> bore, they, they bore two kinds of fruits. Nodules in the spring that usually come and they're abundant to eat. Now, what are nodules? They are basically these lumps in the, in the, in the roots that, <clears throat> excuse me, that grow. And if you have nodules in the roots of a, from the plant itself, then you'll have the second thing, which is the harvest, which is the fruit itself. So if the fruit doesn't have nodules, you basically won't have fruit. So that's what I'm trying to say here. But Mark tells us that it wasn't the season for figs, and the branches had nothing but leaves. In other words, there were leaves but no nodules, which meant that there would be no fruit. Something was definitely wrong with the tree. Now, when you plant a tree, not all tree grows, you know. Not every plant that you plant grows. There are some grow, some die, some may look like it's about to die, some may look like it's fruitful, but it's not. So it all depends on the tree, on the plant itself. Which is why Jesus curses because you see what I'm trying to say here. When, the, when Jesus and the disciples leave the temple, they notice now the tree is dead. And if you are one of Jesus' disciples, all of a sudden, pieces are starting to rapidly come into your head together. You see, in Jewish culture, they are turned to learn the Torah and the Tanakh and other scriptures when they were young, at the age of five to six, seven years old like that. And they learn throughout 13 years old, and from 13 years old, they go out to be adults. They fight in battles, they help their fathers, they do this and do that. And they know their scripture. They know their scripture. They're not some, some uneducated disciples here, okay? They know what's going on. They see something that's happening here. You remember that the tree bore no fruit. You'd be thinking what you just encountered in the temple with the Israelite people, with the leaders. But then there's this other part of you in your head that tells, Scripture tells, refers to Israel as a fig tree. And then the final piece suddenly lands into your head, a scripture, something that the Jews probably have learned when they were young. And it's probably at this moment where they realize that it's very, very serious. In Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 13. I will surely consume them, says the Lord. No grapes shall be on the vine, nor figs on the tree. 
and the leaf shall fade, and the things I have given them shall pass away from me, or from them. Now, you realize that that scripture is referring to this scene. Something that has been fulfilled. 600 years of duration has passed by, and Jesus gives this scene here to tell something that's very important. Jesus didn't just kill a random tree, okay? Jesus doesn't do things aimlessly. He always does it with a purpose. And this whole thing regarding about the fig tree, the temple and the fig tree again, all this connects to something much bigger. You see, what they're realizing right now is the fig tree represents the people of Israel. Specifically, the religious leaders. They're getting in the way of that kingdom. This triumphant entry that Jesus had the day before, they're undermining that. They're thinking that they're the only ones who can and will be saved. They think that salvation is only exclusive to them because they're part, they follow the laws and other oral traditions. They think that just being part of the Israelite people makes them more worthy than others. Now, I remember when I went to Israel, um, some of them are pretty, I don't want to say anything bad, but some of them are pretty stuck up. They are a bit... In Malay, we call it hirong tinggi. They look at you, they may look nice to you. Of course, some of them are nice. I'm not saying everybody that is horrible, but I'm saying that they are nice people. But when there are some of them, they think just by being Jew, just by being called the, from the generation of Abraham, they think that they are so special that to you, you're nothing to them. And yes, there are many incidents when I encountered where they talk to me like I'm an alien. And you'll know that there's something is still happening today. It's still, and you know that something is still happening today. But Jesus, you know, the best thing and the great thing about Jesus is that he says that there is something wrong with them. Do you notice every time when the scribes and the chief priests they get into an argument with Jesus, he always tells that there's something wrong with them. They may look beautiful on the outside but they are whitewashed tombs on the inside. They look good, but they aren't producing fruit. Something is wrong with them. And God, you see, is extending the promise beyond the Israelite people. God's promise, something that the Israelite people believed belonged to just them, is now being extended beyond the Israelite people. And here's why we should still be concerned about the message. The reason that Jesus is so frustrated with the people He sees in the temple is because they were God's hope for the world. God looked at Abraham and said, through your offspring, all nations will, will be blessed. Isaiah, in, in the book of Isaiah, God says, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will show my glory. Their purpose as people of God was to be wholly devoted to revealing God's glory to the world. Not just believing it in themselves, but revealing it to everybody. This was to be their identity. Their whole life told the story of who God is, God's plan for the world, but they stopped. What I mean by that, they basically closed off the community rather than revealing God to the world so that all might worship God. They focused simply on their own worship. Instead of focusing on reaching to others, they focused on their own relationship with God, building on their own culture and never looking out for other people. And here we are, 2,000 years later, and we have to keep asking, or mostly we have to ask ourselves now, have we become dead fig trees? You see, as a church, have we become so focused on ourselves, our squabbles, our traditions, our struggles, that we've forgotten who we were called to be? We've forgotten that the very first words of Jesus' great commission is go. I mean, let me ask you personally, or oh, don't need to answer me, okay? But personally, ask, answer in your own heart. Do you personally struggle with this, struggle to go? I do. 
I struggle to get young people to church. Do you think it's easy to get the next generation to come to church? Do you think it's easy to get young people to enter into, the, into, into church? Do you struggle to get people to come to church? Don't need to even answer me. You, you know in your heart, it, it is hard. It is so hard that most of the time, they don't care. They don't want to be part of it. You get lost focusing on your own relationship with Jesus, on your own church community, and you forget that the responsibility of all disciples is to make more disciples. You see, Jesus wants to be sure that this never happens to us, that we are never to be fig trees who forget our purpose, that we don't just focus on what's going on within our church and our Christian relationship and forget that God is calling us to move beyond the walls that we don't just let, let the name Christian be a name we call ourselves, but that we realize that Jesus is giving us the opportunity to be transformed so that our whole lives speak to God's glory, so that every action is seen through the lens of how we can share the good news of Jesus with others, so that when people see us, they can't help but worship God. This is who Jesus is giving us the opportunity to be. And so today I want to invite you, church, to rise and seize, rise within yourself and seize this opportunity. Don't allow yourself to become a dead fig tree. The most important is don't allow the church to become a dead fig tree. Move beyond the church walls. Be it on the walls of your computer screen or your phone screen and spread the goodness of God, God's good news. Let the whole world know that the time has come, church. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent. Believe in the good news. Let them know that salvation is here, church. Our King has come and His name is Jesus. Amen? And here are some points I want to leave with you because it is something that we all need to learn from this victory. I'm not just talking here saying uh, and, and ex explaining the situation here. I'm here to tell you what we can learn. This victory, the situation with this victory has opened up a lot of opportunities for us to do better. In this story, we see stubborn hearts riddled with pride. Someone said true. Oh. They are not the only one who believes it. But, hold on. Hold on. Okay. Stubborn hearts riddled with pride. The Jewish people felt their actions, deeds, and the states of their hearts were being righteous, despite God pointing out their sins. Now, as followers of Christ, we have to make a decision whether we are to live for ourselves or live on in the vine in Christ. You see, the first point you must know is that God is willing to forgive and is patient. Now, obviously, praise be to God for always forgiving us, and He always gives us more than a second chance. The good news from this story is that God, who is known as the Master Gardener, is merciful and willing to forgive. Amen? He is patient, but His patience will run out. Neither you nor I want to be on the receiving end of the axe. It's better to repent, church, and turn from your sins that are preventing us from living fully for Christ before His patience runs out. The second point we must know is that we have to stay rooted in Christ. Is this one I can't stress too much because honestly, this on its own is it speaks many, many, many. You see, the fruit tree, which is known as each of us now, requires a lot of time, a lot of investment, and proper handling to enjoy its fruits year after year, right? It's a reward to see an apple tree or a fig tree weigh down its luscious uh, ripened fruits for the picking, even through life storms. We have no control over our circumstances or situations, but we do have control over how we respond. Do we blame God? Or do we dig our roots in deeper? In this parable, Jesus knows we're human. Or in this scene, Jesus knows we're human. We're frail. We have weaknesses and temptations. 
But it is up to us to rely on Jesus for the strength and wisdom to navigate what comes our way. If you want something that can inspire you more, Psalms 1 3. And this one, you, everybody mostly should know because it's quoted most of the time. But we forget it. He is like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaves shall not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. If you are really rooted in Christ, what can shake you? What can move you? If your foundation is built on Christ, then what that is outside of the comfort of, of the church shall disturb you. Someone has asked me before, um, this was long ago, but this was one of my youths, I'm not going to mention name, who mentioned that um, how can I be so spiritual? Because every time I become so spiritual, I get so tempted. I get so shaken easily. I have no... I, I, I feel like God is so different. He's this and that. And you know what I'm trying to say? When you're, an, you're, when you're an adolescent, you have many questions that need answers. But I replied to this young person, a pers if... A man, a man who is led by the Spirit will never be shaken. If you are led by Christ, and if you are rooted in Christ, and if you have the foundation based on what Christ teaches and what Christ gives to us now, then why are you easily shaken? We sing the song, On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. We, we are so easily shaken by what has happened. Like, I will be very honest with you, when my dad left, left I was easily shaken because I never thought it would happen to me. But instead, I understand now that even though it has happened to me, I have to be rooted in Christ because only Christ can comfort me through my time of sorrow. The Bible says, God is a father to the fatherless. If God can, will never leave you nor forsake me, if Christ died for me, and if truly, truly His Word says He loves me so much that He'll forever be with me till I go and see Him in glory, then what can shake me, church? What can shake me? God promises me so much. And He's not just promising to the Jews. He's actually also promising to us. Whatever the Jews get, we receive it as well. The difference is, how do we respond when the situation hits us pretty hard? Do you want to run from God or do you want to go to Him, all who are weary, and He shall give you rest? The last one is Jesus doesn't, let me put it in a very simple way. Jesus doesn't tolerate false appearances. What I mean by that? Jesus cursed the fig tree because it had an appearance of fruitfulness. As I said, not all trees are, are fruitful. Some have fruit, some don't have. Some may look it's fruitful, but it doesn't have anything on it. I know because I planted a few fruits before. All died. And it's not good. When a fruit, when a fruit tree plant <laughs> dies, it either is your fault or it's the plant's fault. And mostly, we blame the plant. We don't blame ourselves. But it was deceptive. Check. It was deceptive. It didn't produce fruit. This falseness is the essence of one word that we can summarize together. It's called hypocrisy. The Bible is full of verses where Jesus addresses hypocrisy. He witnessed it so often, he used the tree in this story as a vivid depiction of it. The day before he told this, uh, this, this, uh, that he cursed the tree, he had entered the temple courts to find his father's house being turned into a market filled with people who didn't care about God. But they were taking advantage of those hearts who wanted to honor him. It wasn't just about making a quick buck here. He doesn't want us to be whitewashed tombs. Our time to choose Him and bear fruit is running out, church. When, G when the quoting of Psalms is mentioned, Hosanna, blessed He comes in the name of the Lord. Hey, be on alert. He's coming back again. We do not know the time or day or year or even month or even season or even what eclipse we, we, we read online. But all we know is that He's coming. 
And all I can say to you, church, is time is running out. Time has ran out for my dad. I could have shed more to him. But somewhere along the line, I believed, I believed that he knew who, who, who Jesus is. Somewhere along the line, he probably called out to Jesus. And I can just hope and pray that he is with my Father in heaven. And I often tell God, God, tell my dad I miss him. I could have shed more, but somewhere along the way, my father, my earthly father, somehow called upon Jesus. And I'm still clinging on to that hope, to that trust, that belief that he is with my heavenly father. It's a very different kind of message you hear, right? It's not a message normally not a lot of people hear. But why most of my messages is all about revealing certain things from it because church, technically, how many of us are like the tree? I'm not going to, don't answer, please. Don't, don't, don't throw stones at me after this also. But how many of us are like the tree? We look good. We feel it. We do it. We pro, we, we, sometimes we live it out, sometimes as Christians. But are we doing it enough? Example, every Sunday, I bet after this, what are we going to eat afterwards? Do you have plans? Hey, brother and sister, let's go Yamcha. Oh, some of the, well, those laughing, I think you're the ones who are already guilty. But it is true. We have every Sunday come with the same character. Yes, we are happy, we are joyful to be in God's presence. But after Sunday comes Monday. It's known as Monday blues. Oh, back to work again. We have to have the atmosphere of joy, right? As what Pastor Dave mentioned last week. Joy in knowing that we should never become like that tree. We should become more than that tree to bear its fruits for the world. So the world who eats from it will know and taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? Let us all bow down and close our eyes and just thank God and just let Jesus trim us and God being the master gardener will make us a whole new different kind of tree. Gracious Father, thank you for the message that was spoken in Mark chapter 11. Father God, you are always good to us. You are known as the master gardener and no matter what, whatever things that we, are, that we carry upon our life. I pray, O oh Father, that you will cut it down in, our, in us. Whatever that's stopping us from coming into your presence to worship you, to be able to serve you, to do more for you. What's stopping us, Father? Pray, pray, Lord, that you will eliminate it, cut it down, trim us down, and make us not like the fig tree, but into something that produces fruits. Lord, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, once again for giving your life. And we cannot thank you enough for all that you've done. We just thank you, Jesus. And as we, Lord, depart from this, let us not just only depart and then forget what we were called to do, to make more disciples, to be a blessing to the world, just like how the Jews were supposed to be. I pray, Lord, Father, that you use us and Lord, that you will guide us, whether we go into our workplace, for those in our schools, in our own ministries. I pray, Father God, that the fruits that we produce here will bear fruits abundantly for the other people who receive it. As we depart, Lord Father, may we depart with your blessing. May the Lord bless us and keep us. Lord, make your face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Lord, lift your countenance towards us and Lord, give us peace. In the blessing name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with us now and until eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.